All right, so thanks everyone for hanging around. Um, I'm sticking with uh, rare earths. Uh, I'm gonna move away from Queensland, but I am gonna come back to Queensland at the end and in particular touch on some of the things that Matt was just talking about or, or link back into Matt's talk. So as Helen said, I'm now at the University of Adelaide, but this work was done at JCU uh, and most of it really is the work of Timor Nazari de Cordia here. He was a PhD student who worked on this with myself and Nick Oliver and also with Robin Wilson from Northern Minerals. So this is uh, a mineral, it's a new mineralization style which is really based on the mineralization found at Brown's Range, which is in Western Australia, which we'll get onto. And it's significant because it, it probably, as a new mineralization style, it has uh, potential to be a found, I think, across the continent and in uh, including Queensland. All right, so let's go out a bit to where we find rare earth deposits more generally. Um, uh, so this is a, a pie diagram from Wang et al. and showing you where global rare earth resources are in categories. And you can see here in red, about half of them are in carbonatites. And we've heard about some of those today, but in reality, it's actually much bigger than that because this, this is broken down into tailings, which are just already mined carbonatites in most cases. So that green, uh, green segment there is also mostly carbonatite and the laterite soil clay are usually weathered altered carbonatites as well. So carbonatites probably make up about two, uh, three quarters of the global rare earth resources. Uh, the alkaline complexes and pegmatites, again, that, that piece of the pie is actually mostly alkaline complexes and are similar to the things that Ross was talking about. So peralkaline, alkaline uh, silicate complexes and then we've got IOCGs, and most of that is actually Olympic Dam. So without Olympic Dam, that's a pretty small piece of the pie. So when you break that down, it's these igneous rocks, alkaline igneous rocks, carbonatites that make up most, uh, um, that host most rare earth deposits. So the uh, magmatic or magmatic related deposits, including uh, ICGs for that matter. And so for an exploration, um, a very simple exploration model, that's what you target. You go for carbonatites or alkaline complexes, and that makes sense. Uh, the problem for Australia is we don't have too many of those. Uh, this map here is showing you where we see rare earth deposits in Australia, uh, broken down by into four, four groups here. So carbonatites in blue, scans and ICGs I've lumped together in that pinky color, peralkaline volcanics in green, and the unconformity model the uh, deposits which I'm going to talk about now are in in um, in yellow and Australia so when I'm talking about rare earth deposits here I'm talking about the lanthanides plus yttrium I'm not including scandium because um, geochemically scandium is very different from the, the lanthanides uh, so these are just the hard rock uh, deposits we're not looking at mineral sands or anything like that here um, but the picture for Australia is that it mostly fits with the the global picture most of our resources are sitting in carbonatites and um, pre-alkaline volcanics. And the Browns range uh, in the middle of the map here, up in the, uh, we'll, we'll zoom into that in a minute, the unconformity style is the one I'm gonna talk about today. All right, so gray ton plot here, the economic geologists love these, uh, but there is some interesting things here and um, both Matt and Michael have touched on the value of individual rare earths. So having a, a plot like this in some ways is meaningless having total rare earth oxides, which is the vertical axis, because different rare earths are worth different values. And we see that here. So the, the, the highest grade deposits. Um, so here the, it's the same color coding for these are global deposits and the Australian deposits are uh, labeled here and bolded. And we see Nolan's Ball, Mount Weld, and, and some of these other carbonatite associated things are very high grade, but they're light rare earth rich. The, the peralkaline things, Tungai, Brookmans, and Peak Ranges that Ross talked about uh, are lower grade, but they have much higher proportion of the heavier rare earths, which are more valuable. And off to the side here, you see Olympic Dam, um, a very high tonnage, but low grade, and at the moment is not, a, not considered as an economic resource for, for rare earths. Brown's Range, which is the one I'm talking about, is just this guy in, you know, off here to the left, uh, and it looks pretty pathetic on this plot. Really, it's it's low, low grade and fairly low tonnage, but it's actually the uh, 
it's probably the only producer of dysprosium on the planet outside of China at the moment. So it's actually an active mine and together with Mount Weld is, is one of the two operating uh, producers of rare earths from Australia. So what's so good about Brown's Range? And the answer again is in its inventory of rare earths, it's very, very rich in the heavy rare earths, particularly dysprosium, which makes it an economic deposit. All right, so where's Brown's Range? Uh, so zooming in, it's right, sits right on the border of Western Australia in the Northern Territory, in the Northern Tanami area. Uh, these, so the top in, in plot A here, this is these uh, red stars represent um, examples of where this mineralization occurs. Uh, most of it's in this Browns range, which is blown up a little bit underneath, but there are occurrences, well, more than occurrences, they're really fairly decent prospects of heavy earth mineralization all the way up into the into the Halls uh, Creek origin at John Galt and down into the Tanami down here. Uh, and given that this all of this mineralization essentially has only been recognized in the last 10 or 15 years, um, there's a lot more potential, obviously. So zooming in on the Browns Range Dome, which is where Northern Minerals are currently working. Uh, so that's the, the big plot. I'll go straight to the big map on the, on the right. Uh, we've got the basement geology here, which is the, the, the blue color, which is BRM. That stands for Browns Range Metamorphics. These are uh, meta sediments, meta arcos, so immature sandstones and conglomerates. Uh, they're, they're late Archean in age, so it's, it's one of the, the only pieces of Archean crust in, this cent in, in, in Central Australia, really. And overlying that to the left here, this, this yellow colour is the Birundudu uh, group sandstone, so this is the, um, these are probably mesoprotozoic in age and they're unconformably overlying those uh, the Browns range metamorphic. So this thick black line here represents a regional unconformity. All the stars represent prospects or deposits of this heavy rare earth mineralization. Wolverine up the north here is currently what they're mining, plus these two stars below that. Uh, they're, and they're looking to probably start um, mining some of these other deposits as well. And so all of these are pretty much you know, very, you know, as much as you can say, they're essentially identical in their mineralization features in their geology. So they all form along uh, faults, uh, near vertical faults, things like Wolverine, where we get the best mineralizations on the intersection of faults, or they're forming right on the unconformity surface, like in the south here, we see Cyclops and Iceman. So these are all named after X-Men characters. Uh, all of these prospects and deposits. So this, um, if you want more details on this, there's a series of papers by uh, Timor come out in the last few years, and I can send anybody the papers if they're interested in it. So the important things here, we've got uh, uh, a late Archean basement rocks here, the brown range metamorphics, uh, metamorphos sediments overlain by quartz rich sandstones, the Burunduda group. There are a few uh, granites. You can see the granite, um, the Browns Range Dome granite there. That's also about 2.5 billion years old. And the ultramafics are uh, undated, but they predate the regional metamorphism, which is about 1.75 billion years ago. All right, the mineralization itself, uh, it's very much structurally bound. Uh, it, form, it forms along these fault structures in the Browns Range Arcos and you, you have a, a sort of a zoning to the ore where the core of the, these fault structures have a, a very massive chaotic breccia, which is what this bottom photo looks like. This, all of this pink stuff here is actually xenotime. So rare earth phosphate, uh, and it sits in a matrix, basically quartz uh, xenotime matrix with a little bit of hematite, and all of these clasts here are altered pieces of the host rock, the Browns Range Arco. So the, the ore styles uh, vary from this sort of chaotic breccia. And as you move away from the, the central portion of the ore zones, you go into these crackle breccias and veins. And you can see here these uh, xenotime quartz veins uh, type material here. So this is what the, the uh, mineralization looks like, very much uh, confined to these, these structures. And in terms of mineralization, we're only talking about two ore minerals. So it's very unusual for a rare earth ore deposit because most rare earth ore deposits have a whole host of different rare earth minerals, as, as Michael pointed out as well. Uh, here we've only got xenotime and fluorensite. Uh, there are different generations of um, these minerals. 
coming in and, and Timor's done a great job to pull this all apart. But uh, the simple message here is two ore minerals, one hosts the heavier rare earths and one the light. And then the gang minerals are essentially quartz with a bit of hematite, very little else here. No carbonates. Uh, Xenotime is a great mineral to date. You can do uranium lead dating on it directly. So you're directly dating uh, the mineralization. It's one of the advantages of a, a rare earth deposit is you don't, you often don't have to infer ages of mineralization. You can date them directly, although you do have to be very careful about what those ages mean. Uh, and so Timor's pulled that apart. And what we see here in this plot is ages for various generations of mineralization from all these numbers going um, and uh, sample numbers going down the side represent samples of different prospects and deposits in the in the dome and the ages whether it's the breccia hosted or the vein hosted all come in at between 1.6 and 1.65 billion years ago some of the more regional further afield um, mineralization that we see at john galt in the in the halls creek origin and Killy Killy Hills to the south, for example, these are, are, are dates by uh, City Moore and Carr and others from the West Australian Survey also give very similar ages. So across the entire area, it seems that the, the mineralization was fairly pretty much restricted to this age. There is some late reworking of the ore in these green ones, but don't worry too much about those. So how does that sit in terms of the, the local geology and even the broader geology? Um, this is in the North Australia Craton we are, and at this, this time, most of the North Australia Craton was assembled at 1.6. And in the local area of the Tanami, there was really nothing going on. Um, all the, most of the granites were in place well before this, 100 or 150 or 200 million years before this. And the only uh, real tectonic activity in the region is possibly the start of the Mount I the Eisenerogeny, um, the early stages of that. And to the south in the Arunta region, we had the collision of the Warumpi terrain, which is associated with the Liebig orogeny. But these are very far afield from uh, Brown's range at the time. Uh, the other thing to note is that there are no igneous rocks that we have found that can be associated with this age anywhere in the region here. So we've got a mineralization style here that's not related to magnetism, which is very unusual for rare earth deposits, and it's not related to tectonics, which is actually not so unusual for, for rare earth deposits, but that's a separate story. The lack of magnetism is, um, is unusual, and the lack of alkaline magnetism in particular. So where do we get the rare earth form from then? So for an alkaline system, as Ross showed and, and uh, Michael showed, is they're, they're great ways to transport rare earths, but if we don't have those, how do we get them? Well, these, these deposits are all hosted in metasediments, and in the Browns Range Dome, they're in the Browns Range Arcos. Uh, so here, we're, we're simply looking at some, uh, some geochemistry, rare earth plots to, to chondrite. The ore is in the gray field here. You can see the very uh, heavy rare earth rich nature of the ore, which is why it is valuable. It has a distinct Europium anomaly, you see here, um, which is shared by the host rocks, the Browns Range Metamorphics, BRM here in blue. Uh, these are fairly normal clastic sedimentary signatures, but what's unusual here is where the, the red arrows are. We see this depletion in the, in the uh, elements that are most enriched in the ore. In fact, there's almost, uh, it's kind of a, a mirror image between the host rocks and the ore themselves. And this depletion we see is not, is not really easily attributable, attributable to the source itself. And that's the, what's represented with the other plot there which is a couple of rare earth ratios. What it's trying to show there is that the source of the brown range metamorphics, uh, which ultimately was an Archean granite, it's, it's uh, weathering and erosion of an Archean granite, which is the green symbols here. Um, they have a, a range of, of compositions here, which can be related to various uh, sources of those granites related to garnet, but that doesn't explain the depletion trend we see in the brown range metamorphics, which is heading off in this direction. What is interesting here is that the direction of depletion is going in the exact opposite direction of where the ore sits on this diagram, which indicates that you're leaching out these rare earths from the, the metasediments and redepositing and moving them and, and depositing them in these fault zones to make the ore. Uh, in other words, these are uh, sediment-sourced sediment rare earth deposits. 
and really the sort of the nail in the coffin for this idea is from from isotopes a lot of you don't probably cringe a little bit when you see isotope diagrams but this one is pretty simple so this is epsilon neodymium so calculated to the time of all formation 1.665 ish what we've got is uh, the ore samples of the ore which are these colored bars at the bottom um, either from minerals or from bulk rock which is the red and they all come in at around minus 20 epsilon neodymium which is very very crustal so mantle derived rocks such as alkaline magmas all would be sitting in that gray field at the top between about minus five and plus five or even up higher so these certainly aren't mantle derived but what they are is they they do match very well bock rot samples from the browns range of metamorphics which are the the, the browned field here so the isotope signature tells us it fingerprints the source as being the browns range metamorphics and the chemical signature seems to work for that as well so we get the rare earth from the, the, the uh, sediments. How do we move the rare earths is the next question because rare earths are not particularly mobile uh, in hydrothermal fluids. But what we see from the ore itself, so this panel A, we have um, a, a backscatter electron image of, a, of, a, of the ore. The xenotime is sitting there very nice and bright and we have two micas in there. One is textually associated with the ore, which is a syn ore muscovite. And then there's a, a, a prior muscovite the coarse grained metamorphic muscovite that predates the ore and those two mi mica generations are distinct and the, and the really important thing to point out here is that the syn ore mica the one that forms with the ore is uh, distinctively enriched in fluorine and chlorine so halogen rich minerals yeah halogen rich elements and so this indicates that the hydrothermal fluids that were responsible for mineralization were halogen rich and we also have evidence for this from fluid inclusion studies. So another uh, part of Timor's work was to do a very detailed study on the fluid inclusions that are uh, hosted in quartz that is directly associated with the mineralization. And without going into too much detail here, uh, there are uh, multiple generations of fluid inclusions. Um, so Timor looked at, at um, mineralized veins and he also looked at quartz from barren veins in the area that don't have any mineralization. The barren veins only have very water rich inclusions, which are these type one in, uh, in green here on this diagram, uh, essentially a meteoric water. And the mineralized veins have uh, uh, that fluid as well, but they also have uh, very saline fluids in here. So NaCl, CaCl bearing saline fluids. Okay, so we have high salinities and experimental work has, has shown that if you have saline fluids, you can actually transport rare earths in that fluid better than, than say non-saline fluids. Although the solubility is not particularly high. So if you're going to make a rare earth deposit, you really need to move a lot of fluid um, to do that. And we have got evidence of very high fluid fluxes at Brown's range as well. When we look at this as bulk rock, potassium versus aluminium in uh, just assays, one meter assays of the of drill core samples. In blue here, we've got the background Brown's range metamorphics, the meta sediments that are sort of spanning this field here. These are quartofilspathic clastic sediments. Um, but when we get into the ore grade, into the ore, um, keep in mind that both aluminium and potassium are not ore minerals. They're in the, in the background silicates. Uh, we see an array, the rocks basically turn into quartz plus muscovite. So muscovite plots off the top and the array that, that links these two is where all the ore samples sit. So this, this, uh, this indicates that there's been extensive fluid flow through this these um, fault zones that host mineralization and you convert all the silicates to just muscovite and quartz, which really requires high fluid flux. And that's a really important um, component of this model. And the third one is how do you precipitate the rare earth? So you can move them, um, but you need to precipitate them. And they're, they're now hosted in, in rare earth phosphates and rare earth phosphates are notoriously uh, insoluble in fluids. So it's very unlikely we're carrying phosphorus and rare earth together. Uh, it's very difficult to do it that way. So we would need two separate uh, fluids to do that. And indeed the fluid inclusion work show that there are two fluids. There's a salty fluid. Uh, so this is a temperature of homogenization versus temperature of melting diagram for fluid inclusions. Essentially the bottom axis is salinity with high salinity going to the left. So these are saline fluids over here and laser ablation work we've done shows they do actually host rare earths. There is rare earths in those fluids. 
And our model essentially is you have saline fluids, you have low salinity water rich fluids, and you mix them in these fault zones uh, or on the unconformity surface. And that mixing brings the phosphorus and rare earths together, which together are very insoluble and you precipitate out rare earth phosphates like crazy. So it's a very efficient precipitation mechanism. Just for comparison in green here is again, these barren, um, the, the uh, fluid inclusions from the barren uh, veins and you see they only have that one fluid composition, the water rich inclusion. They don't have the high salinity ones. So that comes, brings us to the model here. Um, what we've got is an unconformity surface. The, the, the basement here is the Archean Browns range metamorphics. What we see is that we have some saline uh, fluids coming up from this basement, the exact source of that fluid we don't really know. It's uh, carrying rare earths in that fluid. It's traveling up along these fault structures. And from above, we have the overlying uh, Birundudu sandstones, which have uh, phosphorus bearing fluids. So low, low pH fluids that can carry phosphorus moving down. And in the intersection of these two fluids where they mix along these faults or all, along the unconformity, uh, they uh, basically precipitate rare earth phosphates and drop out. And, here, and there's the reaction at the bottom that also basically explains the, the uh, silicate alteration assemblages there. So that's the model that we have for how this forms. Um, and uh, the nice thing about it is we, you know, these, this is not a particularly unusual environment. We don't need um, very rare and unusual uh, alkaline magmas such as carbonatites, which are not so common on the Australian continent. And so there is actually a lot of potential for this mineralization style to be found all across Northern Australia. So here's where we already find it. There's, I think there's a lot of potential in across the Birundudu group sandstone in the Pine Creek inlay is an obvious one. We already have unconformity uranium deposits there. Uh, it's the right geological setting. Uh, so why not look for rare earths? Um, so essentially the model is very similar to unconformity uranium model, except we, we don't have a redox uh, precipitation mechanism needed here. So MacArthur Basin is also a target. And then coming back to Queensland, we, we're thinking about Mount Isa Inlaya because uh, coming back to what uh, Matt was talking about, there are all the ingredients we need for this particular model. We have a, um, the younger sediments, the phosph phosphorus bearing Georgina Basin is our source for phosphorus, uh, overlying, unconformly overlying the Mount Isa Inlaya, which is very halogen rich. We've got these A-type intrusions, which are fluorine rich and lots and lots of uh, chlorine bearing calc silicates like the Corella formation, which potentially uh, can produce chlorine bearing fluids and, and obviously has, has been uh, an important part for ICG mineralization. So we think that this uh, unconformity between the, the Cambrian Georgina Basin and the Mount Isa Inlaya may be a great place to, to find this mineralization style. Uh, especially if it's overprinting already phosphate or rare earth rich rocks as, as Matt was uh, pointing out. Okay, that's my talk done. Thanks for hanging around. Thank you so much, Carl. And you can see that there is really a link between a lot of the projects that have been presented here today. They do all work together as we learn more and more about these systems. Um, I think there are some questions for Carl. Um, any idea what could be the source of high saline fluids? Could it be the Archean Felsnick Basement? Uh, yes, uh, we have some ideas, but I wouldn't put much faith in the ideas because we really don't have have much data on that at the moment. Um, the the actual the Archean Basement is actually newly defined as well. So one of uh, the first things that Timor did in his PhD was actually figure out the age of that basement and, and examine those rocks. So that's a whole nother um, project yet to be done is figure out what that is and where that comes from. Uh, but it's a, it's a bit of a mystery. We don't really know where those, those fluids are coming from and, and, and how, you know, anything about them really. So that's kind of the next stage of research, I guess we'll get onto that. Um, Alison Britt from GA has said, great talk, Carl. Your model opens up new spaces for rare earth exploration. And John Anderson says, welcome to South Australia. 
sounds like unconformity potential here as well. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, I think there is definitely. Um, that's something we'll be looking at in South Australia with the uh, some of the Neoproterozoic basins overlying the the Gawler Range volcanics and the the Mount um, Olympic Dam domain. Certainly. So, yeah, definitely on the radar. Um, Chandan says again, what are what about the faults? Are they crustal scale, deep angle faults? Uh, they're very steep. They're. I, uh, as in crustal scale, as in uh, going through the crust, I don't think so. Mostly, um, well, they're not really mapped that that deep, but these are not really big, big structures. Um, they're, 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 they're fairly small. But, you know, the work hasn't been done really to map them out and understand them in detail. But So we don't actually know how deep they go, but they don't look like they're, they're really big structures. They're not you know, they don't have, they're not shear zones that have, have seen massive movements or anything like that. They're probably related to the actual formation of the doming, um, which we actually don't have timing on that too well yet either, but presumably is around this, is probably similar to the timing of mineralization we expect. The same, I mean, you could say the same thing about unconformity uranium deposits, the faults that host them are, are sometimes have very minor displacements. They don't, they're not the they're not the big monster faults with, you know, with hundreds of kilometers of displacement. Yep. Ian Wolf says, great presentation and clear, simple model derived from good, sophisticated work. Um, and then Michael Annenberg, Carl, is the inference of NaCl, Ca, Cl2, et cetera, based on freezing temperatures? Or do you have data showing that chlorides are actually inside the fluid inclusion? Um, both. So mostly it's from the microthermometry, but we do have laser work that shows that there is chlorine in there. So, you know, chlorine is not so good by laser. So the, the resolution is pretty poor, but certainly we do get chlorine in there. And uh, we don't see carbonates. So that's probably where you were going with that, Michael, I, I suspect. But at the moment, this is the amazing thing about Brown's Range is really carbonate free. There's no, we don't see even a, a grain almost not a grain of calcite anyway. And what about sulfates? I'm finishing off Michael's question for us. <laughs> My uh, capability as a panelist. Uh, so, so we just have a paper submitted uh, in review on uh, showing that at 200 degrees, if you have you no know, carbonate and chlorides and all that uh, together in fluid, you can get a uh, solubility of 3000 ppm of dispersion, which is a lot. And that could easily make something that you have. But it looks like the, the, what you need for that is uh, potassium, which you have in your Moscovite, so that's easy. Uh, but chlorine and fluorine and carbonate. Now, it could be that maybe there's carbonate that was there and not there anymore, because if it ended up being just potassium carbonate, it's soluble and gone. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, these rocks are also remarkably depleted in calcium. There's almost no calcium, which is why we get xenotime and fluorensite. We don't get any apatite um, or, or fluorite for that matter. Uh, it's possible, but you know, we looked at a lot of these rocks and we don't even see a little bit of calcite. We do see a little bit of um, phosphate. So there's a little bit of late uh, gypsum, which is in cavities. And, um, but it doesn't, it, it seems to be late. We don't see much phosphate, uh, sorry, sulfate. Um, associated with with the actual uh, ore stage. Can I ask a question? Uh, oh, you? okay. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll read out one from Edward and then... It's, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go. Yep. Um, what's the best tectonic setting for exploration of rare earths? That's one um, that anybody can jump in and answer because I think that's, um, that's a bit of a tricky one. I, I, I'll Maybe I'll start. I think... Uh, no tectonic setting, as in not, um, I, I think you don't want to, any, any active margin is not a place to go. You want to be far away from that. Um, I'll plug my paper that's just been accepted in, uh, for publication, which is tectonic setting of rare earth ore deposits, you know, Australian rare earth deposits. So that, that's going to come out soon. Um, basically, you don't, so the, the situation I showed here for Brown's Range, that it's, it's very far away from any active tectonics, is true for pretty much every rare earth deposit in Australia. Um, so we don't, you know, 
I think active tectonics is is not favorable. You, you really need for alkaline magnetism, you need this extended, well, firstly, you need very low degree melting of an enriched source to get an enriched magma, and then you need extensive fractionation and you don't want to muck that up. So uh, very, very passive or, or um, absent tectonics, essentially, I think that's my view. So uh, Ross's talk on peak ranges, that's the only one that's related to a mantle plume, but that's pretty much the only one where you could link it directly to something, an event. All right, jump in, Rick. Well, I was is just going to say- Michael, are you leaving? Sorry, now I'm interrupting you know, over again. To add another thing to the oh. Sonic oh, okay. uh, setting. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Rick. Yeah, all right, yeah, Go. you go ahead, then, and then I'll, I'll yeah. ask my question, which is not related to the tectonic setting, so. <laughs> It's pretty much anywhere because if you look in Africa, in East Africa, you have the, the deposits in carbonate as in the rift zones. If you look in China, those are in collisional settings, so by an oboe and one new ping, so those are in origins. Uh, if you look in Australia, okay, so you have, for example, Norland's bow, which just popped out of nowhere. You have the anchorphomonic types, you have the, the alkaline ones, which are, uh, you know, deep mantle melting. So it looks like there isn't a specific thing you can point to. It's uh, pretty much everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Yeah, but I think there are some places you can rule it out. You, you don't want to look. Um, you don't want too much mantle melting because then your magma is infertile for rare earths, for example. So an active rift that's really gone to full, full rifting is, is probably not a great place, to be honest. Okay, uh, my, my question was, um, was, was I was sort, sort of thinking about um, targeting for this style of mineralization. And of course, when you say to someone, yeah, well, it's easy, just target where the oxidized or where the not oxidized and reduced, I'm thinking about unconformity uranium now, where the, where the low salinity and high salinity fluids mix, um, it, it doesn't actually, it, it makes it a little bit difficult. And, and in unconformity deposits, you can look for that the critical redox boundary, you know, in the in changes in basement composition and faults, and and even maybe something in the in the cover. But it, is there any sort of lithological clue that that you've gleaned from Brown's range that we could use in Queensland in terms of in terms of a preferential host rock, or is it or is it? Do you really think that the the host rock's virtually immaterial, and it's just where these two fluids have mixed? Um, I think the host rock's important. You need, um, so for Brown's range, like I said, they're, they're very low in calcium. So that, that means that, and this is, we need to do more work on this, but it potentially means that if you have saline fluids, particularly fluorine rich fluids passing through it, you don't rip that out by precipitating fluorite. And you also don't drop it out phosphate by precipitating appetite. So that could be important having very low calcium um, lithologies. Uh, I think there are things to develop as exploration tools could be remote sensing techniques, looking at uh, uh, shortwave infrared for looking at certain mica compositions and looking for even fluorescite as a, a shortwave infrared signatures of that. Um, but that's, that's something to be, de to be explored and developed further down the track. But I don't think if you look at Brown's range, the, the overlying, sediments are uh, not particularly phosphate rich at all so you know that's a big question mark on the model you know we're just assuming phosphorus phosphorus comes from fluids and from above but there's not a great case to make from that and um, likewise you know the question about these chlorine rich fluids from underneath we don't know where they come from so to answer your question not at the moment we really need to figure out a lot more to 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 be able to answer those questions Great, thanks. 